Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasul Allah. Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasul Allah. Hayy ala salah. Hayy ala salah. Hayy ala al-falah. Hayy ala al-falah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illa Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadihi al-lazhi nastafa. Khususan ala sayyidi rasuli wa khatim al-anbiya. وعلى آله الأسكياء وأصحابه الأتقياء أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقد مكروا مكرهم وعند الله مكرهم وإن كان مكرهم لتزول منه الجبال فلا تحسبن الله مخلف وعده رسله إن الله عزيز ذو انتقام صدق الله العظيم One of the unique things of life is that throughout your life you will always face some sort of a challenge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it such that every person in this gathering, regardless of age or gender, is going through some unique form of challenge in their life. And each individual's challenge is different from the person they're sitting next to. If as a father you're sitting next to your son right now, you have to learn to accept and acknowledge that you are not the only person in the world that's going through stress. Your son that's sitting next to you right now is also going through his set of challenges. And your daughter that's sitting next to you right now is going through her set of challenges. And the nature of challenges are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you challenges that are set and unique for you. So what may be easy for me is difficult for you. What's difficult for you may be easy for me. So when a father is told that the challenges that his son is going through, many a times the parents, as parents, we become dismissive. We say what he's going through is nothing. Come on, grow up, be tough, you know, be a man about it. There's no need to cry over this issue. But in reality, for those shoulders, for that young person, that challenge in his life is actually a significant challenge. And a great example of this is the story of Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu. Anas bin Malik radiallahu an says that he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he had a brother by the name of Kabisha. He said, a Messenger of Allah, my younger brother's name is Kabisha, and he's very, he's very sad. Now if you were told that there's a young child who's emotionally sad, as adults, what would we be? We would be dismissive again. We wouldn't care much. A young kid, sad, get on with it. Give him some candy, they'll grow up out of it. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's not dismissive. Because he understands that if he appreciates a young man's emotions when he's young, when that, old, when that young man becomes old, he'll be considered of your emotions too. But if you keep dropping your rage on a young man when he's young, when he develops into an older man, in return, he will only receive you with that very same rage. So the Prophet ﷺ, he arrives to the house of Anas bin Malik an. And Anas bin Malik an's house was like a second home for the Prophet ﷺ. Umm Sulaim, who was a mother of Anas bin Malik, was someone very close to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Anas bin Malik radiallahu an says that it was very common that during the midday, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would take a siesta nap, he would go to the house of Umm Sulaim, someone very close to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He comes there, he finds this young child who's very sad. He's sitting by the side. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sat next to him and he cheered him up. Right? He said to him, Ya Aba Umayr, ma fa'al al nughayr even though his name wasn't Abu Umayr, he calls him Abu Umayr. And from this hadith, there are many rulings derived. Some fuqaha have said that you can derive over, you know, 30 or 40 legal rulings from just, just these two statements. Ya Aba Umayr, ma fa'al al which, which is a very interesting discussion for those who have interest in how to derive rulings. 
But nonetheless, if you just look at the words very simply, how the Prophet cheers up this young child, there are two things that we learn. If you ever want to cheer up a young child, there are two simple ways of doing it. The first thing kids love doing, no matter how young your kid is, you can always bring a smile to their face by treating them like an adult. So for example, you have a young child who's 12 years old, you call him, how are you doing, Shaykh? When a father calls his young child Shaykh, what does the young child always do? He cheers up, right? So the Prophet ﷺ doesn't call him Kabsha, he calls him, Ya Aba Umayr, he makes him into an adult. Oh, father of Umayr, you're a, you're, a, you're a man. You're not no young, I'm not speaking to some young kid, someone who's not important, I'm speaking to a young man right here in front of me. And the second thing the Prophet ﷺ does is, when he addresses him, kids love rhymes, especially younger kids, you know? When I was young in, college, when I was young in, uh, in, in, in elementary school, my friends used to say, Hussein is insane. And they used to always make me laugh, because someone rhymed my name. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam rhymes his name and says to him, Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'ala nughayr. And these two things together brought a smile to this young child. Now the interesting thing about this young child is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a unique decree for him, a unique destiny in life. There is a narration that Talha radiallahu an, sorry, Abu Talha radiallahu an, Abu Talha radiallahu an. His young son became very sick. And his young son was so sick that his health began to deteriorate. So the father stopped leaving the home and started spending more time at home. And he would look after his son, take care of him. One day he told his wife that I have to go take care of some things. I want you to look after the child while I go and take care of some chores. So when he left the home to take care of some chores, by the evening when he returned, during that period, his child's health deteriorated so much that the child passed away. And the mother actually washed the body. She shrouded the body, did the kafan herself, and moved the body to the corner of the house. When the father came home, the first thing he asked was, how is our son doing? Now, as a mother, her wisdom was such that she thought that if I tell him right now that our son passed away, he won't eat anything. And one of the etiquettes of sharing bad news is you always make sure the person rested, the person is rested and has eaten. Otherwise, if you tell them the news, they're not going to eat, they're not going to sleep, and it's going to make their difficulty that much more difficult. So she said that, you know, he's in a good place. Some big words like this. So he ate some food. He then went and rested. During the night, they were intimate with one another. The next morning, they, he, uh, when they woke up, she told her husband, I just want you to know that your, our son passed away. He became so sad. But along with being sad, he was shocked that his wife didn't tell him. They had food together. They slept together. They were intimate with one another. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and said, a messenger of Allah, last night, my son died. And he was broken like a man. Imagine someone who's lost a child. And his child was his lifetime, a young child. And he said, not only did he die, but my wife, my, my wife, this is how she dealt with the whole situation. The Prophet ﷺ first said, Inna lillah, for the young child passing away. Then after that he said, maybe through the patience and wisdom of your wife, Allah will give you better than that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then gave him nine sons, all of which were hafid of the Qur'an. Ibn Hazm al-Qur'an says, nine sons were granted to them. And all nine of those sons were hafid of the Qur'an. And this young son who passed away, Abu Talha Ansari radiallahu an, who was he? Ya Aba Umair, ma fa'al It was the same kid who lost his bird. That same kid passed away. You know. Now, why did, why did I connect these two stories? The reason why I connect these two stories is for us to realize that that child's life was very short. But the Prophet wasallam appreciated his life too. He didn't let that child feel lonely and isolated. You know, even the Bedouins, people in the community who are harsh and mean, you know, there are some people in the community who are just harsh. And sometimes we become so full of ourselves that when someone brings a little ego to us, we kick that person out of the door. The Prophet's compassion, look at this. You know, as sometimes as Muslims, we need to focus on, we need to ask ourselves a very root, a very blunt question. Have I adopted the outer, outer features of the Prophet at the cost of losing the heart of the Prophet? You guys understand the point that I'm making here? This is a very serious question. Sometimes you forget to realize that where the outer features of the Prophet ﷺ are important. I don't want anyone to take away from this khutbah that I said that following the sunnah in his garment and his appearance is not important. It is important. But what's also important is that a person brings that heart of the Prophet ﷺ and puts it in the heart of, of their own chest. That where is my heart in comparison to the heart of the Prophet ﷺ? A Bedouin came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked the Prophet ﷺ a harsh question. He said, Mata sa'a, when is the final hour? Now that's like an irrelevant question. Something that has no relevance at all, no benefit at all. It's like the imams, like young guys coming up to the imams and saying, Shaykh, describe to me what Yajuj and Majuj look like. Why does that matter what they look like? 
The description of Ya'juj Ma'juj is not going to change your taqdeer to any degree at all. It's, it's an important part of knowledge, it's there, it's definitely beneficial. But you know, these are questions that don't really bear fruit many times. So he asked a question, he said, you know, um, when is the final hour? The Prophet noticed that his question didn't really bear much fruits. However, the Prophet flipped the question from a question that had a fact involved with it to a, to a question that had a reflection involved with it. So he took him, to, he took him from a factual state when is the final hour? Today, tomorrow? He took him from that factual state to a reflective state. And he said, my, my responding question to you is, what have you prepared for the final hour? And when he hit him like that, that man said, well, I got to think about that. What have I prepared? And his simple response was that I haven't prepared much other than I have some love for Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, Anta ma'aman ahbabt, you will be with the one who you love. This man got so excited. He was so, imagine being told, the Prophet is telling him that if you really love me, you and I, teammates in Jannah. The Sahaba, they say, it's a, this is the same hadith by the way, the Sahabi said, O Messenger of Allah, lahu khasa, that is this statement for him alone or is it for all of us? The Prophet said, Balil amma, it's for everyone. Anyone who loves me will be my companion in paradise. The Sahaba, they say, that was the happiest day in Medina Munawwara. This was the most beloved hadith to all, of the, all the companions. The most beloved hadith of the Prophet Now this Bedouin was so excited, the Prophet just told him that they were going to be companions in paradise, who wouldn't be happy. The Prophet started salah, he was leading the prayer. That Bedouin joined behind, and in the middle of the prayer, someone sneezed. So the Bedouin said, Allahumma arhamni wa muhammada wa la tarhamma ala ahada. He said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and Muhammad. In the middle of Salah, by the way, okay? In the middle of Salah, he shouts out. He said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and Muhammad and no one else. No one else. Only me and Muhammad. Jannah together, two of us, everybody else, find your own place. So after Salah was over, the Prophet ﷺ said, Manil Qail, who said that? He said, It was me, Dul Khawaisir al Yamani. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Laqad hajarta wasi'a. You narrowed such a, such a vast thing. You know, the mercy of Allah is so vast. Wa rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. And you've narrowed it down just to two of us? Really? Only two of us are going to have the mercy of Allah? What about everyone else? Now after this was over, this man had already accomplished his purpose of the journey. He spoke to the Prophet, prayed with the Prophet. God has promised to paradise with the Prophet. So on his way out, he got up. He was a Bedouin. He went to the corner of the masjid and started urinating. In the same masjid. And the companions got up to give this guy a beating because he's shouting in salah, not urinating in the masjid. So the Prophet wasallam said, let it be. He finishes urinating, he left, they poured some water over it and ended the discussion there. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani says, this, this Dhul Khuwaisra al-Yamani is a very important person. And actually it's interesting because Ibn Hajar uses three titles when referring to him. He calls him As-Sail al-Qail al-Ba'il. That's what he calls him. As-Sail al-Qail al-Ba'il. As-Sail means the questioner because he asked the Prophet that question. Al-Qail meaning the one who said it because in the middle of Salah, you know what he said? Al-Ba'il means the urinator because he urinated in the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, this man right here, if you look at his life too, what you learn is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with him according to who he was as a person. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came down to his level, understanding what that individual was going through. So I think the point that I'd like to make very clear for this khutbah is for every person to realize that each person around you is going through something unique in their life, including yourself. What shaitan does is that he makes you feel like you're the only person alive who understands your challenge. And shaitan isolates you. And he makes you feel like nobody else in the world will ever understand what it is that you're going through. And what you're going through right now is a difficulty and calamity that no other human being has ever gone through before. And this is pure deception. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent people before us who went through much more than us. And the, the second thing that shaitan tells people, he tells them that you're going through this calamity right now because Allah hates you, Allah is angry with you. He puts his fear in your heart and takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A calamity is a blessing from Allah if it takes you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's a punishment from Allah if it takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that a calamity that takes me closer to Allah is more beloved to me than a bounty that takes me away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If my wealth takes me away from Allah, give me property. That's why the Prophet made a dua. And my teacher used to always tell us, he used to say, this is one dua of the Prophet that every human being has the heart to make. 
I still remember this clearly. We were sitting in hadith class. The first time I studied this hadith was in Miskat al Masabih. And our teacher said to us, the next hadith, don't say amin to it unless you have the heart to. And I thought to myself, okay, yeah. Which dua, which dua could, could there be that I can't say amin to? And then he read the hadith. And when he read the hadith, there was like a ton of bricks hitting me in my face. And I was like, oh my God. I don't know if I have the iman to say amin to that dua. Allahumma ahyini miskina. Wa amitni miskina. Wa hshurni fi zumarat al masakin. The Prophet is saying, Oh Allah, let me live as a poor person. The exact opposite of the we've been making our entire lives. Let me die as a poor person. Wow. And resurrect me with the poor people on the Day of Judgment. And Ibn Taymiyyah statement is a very interesting one. Because Ibn Taymiyyah historically comes to the world after the Muslims have just finished dealing with the Crusaders and the, and the, and the Mongols have just raided Baghdad. So at that period, in the last century or so, the Muslims lost close to 2 million people. In the last century, that, during that period, 2 million people died. And Muslims were asking this question. The question was, that why did God do this to us? How did we lose so many people? Weren't we on the, on the deen? Aren't we all on the truth? And it's the same question we ask today. And Ibn Taymiyyah came at that time, and he said to the people, that a blessing that takes you closer to Allah, is better than a calamity that takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And don't let, a, don't let the calamity make you feel like you're hated by Allah. Allah doesn't hate you. Allah only tests those who He loves. And the Prophet wasallam said that. Out of all of the creation, Allah tests those the most who He loves the most. And out of all the prophets, Allah, out of all the humans, Allah loves the prophets the most. Therefore, they were tested the most. Ask yourself a question, what did Ayyub salam go through? Ask yourself a question, what does Zakariya salam go through? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Imam Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi quotes this in the tafsir of Surah Maryam in his tafsir Adur al-Manfur. He writes that on the night of Mi'raj, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met Zakariya alayhi salam. You know in Baytul Maqdis where he met all the Prophets on the Isra part of the journey. The Prophet met Zakariya alayhi salam there. And when he, the, now each Prophet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met, he spoke with them, he conversed with them. Imam Suyuti says the reason why he conversed with each of the prophets was because at that point in the prophet's life he was going through a lot of emotional difficulty and he needed consolation so he went to the different prophets and sought consultation from them. That same year the prophet lost his uncle who was like a fatherly figure. That same year he also lost his wife. By then he had already lost two of his sons as well. Qasim and Abdullah had already passed away. So four close family members of the prophet had died within the last decade. The prophet is emotionally, he's going through a lot. And he meets Zakaria alayhi salam and he asked him, Zakaria, how did you deal with the loss of your son? Because Zakaria alayhi salam's son Yahya was also a prophet of Allah. And he was actually killed during Zakaria's life. Zakaria outlived him. And the interesting thing was, Zakaria was given his son Yahya at an old age. He was very old, over 80 years old, and he received his son. His son lived a very short life and died before his eyes too. So the Prophet sallam, asked him, Zakaria, how did you deal with it? So Zakariya salam said, and Imam Suyuti quotes this narration, you can find it in his tafsir. He says, Zakariya salam said, that I stood, so when the, when, the, when the command had been given by the king to behead my son, I took my son by the hand and I realized that we couldn't run anywhere, so I brought him back to the masjid. Back to the masjid, why? He said, I brought him back to the masjid and I stood in the same mihrab where Allah granted me my son. You know, when Zakariya salam, he asked Allah, فَنَادَتْهُ الْمَلَائِكَ وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ يُصَلِّي he was standing in the mihrab praying to Allah and that's when Allah granted him the son. He said, I came back to the same place. And my son said, Yahya said, Father, what are we doing? He said, let us, start, let, let us end this journey where we started it. And they said, Allahu Akbar together. And he said, in salah, while I was praying, I kept my eyes closed and I kept focusing. And during my prayer, they came and they killed my son. And that's how I dealt with it. I came back to my salah, right? And that's where Imam Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi quotes this and he says that, you know, that it's interesting how the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching this, these people that when you go through your difficulty in life, don't think you're isolated, don't think you're disliked by Allah. Your difficulty is to show you your weakness. And every human being has weakness. Let the toughest person in the world come. The most able per per person who has the ability to speak to thousands of people, let him come forward. The strongest person in the world, let him come forward and let him admit to his weakness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always prove that you and I are weak. And no matter how far we try to establish that we're strong, our weakness is inherently a part of our DNA. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas, antumul fuqara'u ilallah. You will always be weak. 
Wallahu huwa al-ghani hamid Strength and independency belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look how independent Allah is. In yasha yudhibkum wa yati bi khalqin jadeed. If he wishes, he can perish you in a single moment. Wa ma dhalika ala Allahi bi aziz. And this is nothing difficult on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you think that you are being punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, you make tawbah to Allah. Maybe it is possible that some of our sins have impacted what we're going through in life. But you make tawbah to Allah. Oh Allah, forgive me, I have done wrong. But after you've made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to continue to beat yourself and say that I'm a sinful person and Allah hates me, Allah is angry with me, you only feel feeding into the trap of shaitan. Yaqub told his sons that only that person is despondent of the mercy of God who is actually a disbeliever. So when you're going through your difficulties in life, first thing I want you to know, this is a sign that Allah loves you. This is your opportunity to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has promised this for you in paradise. Our actions are leading us here. It's this nudge of Allah, you know, like a child is walking, the parent gives him a little nudge, get in the car. So this nudge of Allah is what gets you here. You should, you should thank Allah for the honor of going through calamity. And the second thing, always know that there were people who came before you who went through a lot and there is an example in their life too. Go and study their lives, go and learn their lives. And when you learn from them, it'll give you strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every person their unique challenge in life. You have the ability to pull through it. Your challenge I can't bear, my challenge you cannot bear. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها But your challenge you do have the ability to bear. And it's like for example, a, ch a teacher telling their child that go and memorize five pages of the Qur'an or go and memorize two pages of the Qur'an or you have ten pages of homework. What does a child say immediately? No, that's too much for me, I can't do it. But the teacher knows what the child's ability is without the child even knowing their ability. And your ability is known by Allah without you even knowing your ability. You just have to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you trust Allah, when you make this patience of yours uh, in obedience of Allah, then each calamity of yours will take you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to close with one statement that my teacher used to say. He used to say, win Allah, bring Allah into your life. If everything in the world leaves you and you only have Allah with you, you are successful. And if you have everything in the world, but you lack the presence of God in your life, you actually have nothing. Then he used to say, having Allah with you doesn't mean that all the difficulties of your life will leave. Having Allah with you means those difficulties will become easier for you to deal with. And his exact words were, having Allah with you doesn't mean sailing in a sea which has no waves. Having Allah with you means sailing in a ship which no storm can destroy. That's what it actually means. That's what the ma'iyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about. Fortify yourself. Go in the presence of Allah. Start your salah. Build that bond. If you've tried everything and it hasn't worked, just try this once. And you know when you cry in front of Allah, I'm telling you, I've heard from people who are friends of Allah, who have told us that when they cry in front of Allah, it's the only tears that they actually pray never stop. It's a taste that's so sweet that the heart yearns it. And when the heart feels that experience of crying in front of Allah, they just want that life of theirs to continue onwards. People like you and I may have no idea what that feels like because we haven't built that bond yet. We haven't crossed that bridge yet. We haven't even seen that bridge yet. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to, uh, to, to, to build a connection with Him and to be able to remain patient in our calamities and difficulty and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us in both worlds. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. الحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم وتسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وبرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا المتقين إماما يا رب العالمين اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزجنه في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان وجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم آت نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه نبيك وحبيبك سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاد منه نبيك وحبيبك سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة رحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصلى النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدع اليتيم ولا يحض على طعام المسكين فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون الذين هم يراءون ويمنعون الماعون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First thing first, uh, Jazakallah khair to our guest speaker today, Muti Kamani. Inshallah, he will be leading a workshop tonight on legacy of Abu Bakr al-Diyan from 7 to 10 p.m. Jai will be included. Uh, Imam Ali will be conducting his annual Hajj workshop September 4th from Maghrib to Isha. Uh, IAGD monthly dinner is Saturday, September 12th. And IAGD family fair is September 19th. Uh, if you missed any of this, inshallah, it's on the website and you can contact me. Sakhir, Salaam Alaikum.